yesterday's prophecies for today's world. But greater is he who is in you than he who is in this world. The Holy Spirit dwells in every believer and he is in you and you need not be afraid. And now, how Lindsay's Bible study, the book of John. Tonight, I want to go back over uh, the first part, John 2, verses 1 through 12. I want to go back over that and emphasize a very critical part of understanding the Gospel of John. In John chapter 2, the Apostle John first uses the word Simeon. He says, this beginning of Simeon, Jesus did after he turned the water into wine. Simeon is one of the three words in the Greek Testament that is used for miracles, at least in the Greek New Testament. And uh, there, there is the word dunamis that is used. All of these, by the way, are used in different gospels of the, the miracles of Christ. Dunamis is the word which in English we prematurely assign to the English word dynamite. There's a more powerful explosive today than dynamite, so they should have saved that word. But dunamis is trans translated in English, miracle. But the word dunamis emphasizes the power released in the miracle. And then there's another word, teros, T-E-R-A-S. Teros is a word for miracle which emphasizes the phenomena, the, the, uh, uh, the awe, the thing that the miracle in, inspires in awe to those who observe it. And that's used of the miracles of, of Christ, too, in the Gospels. But John uses basically one word for miracles. It's the other word, the third word that's used in all the Gospels, but used exclusively by John, Simeon. And this word uh, emphasizes the sign that the miracle is designed to present. In other words, it looks at the miracle and when the word Simeon is used, it means that the person who uh, is observing this miracle is supposed to get a deeper spiritual meaning from it. And John builds his gospel around seven specific incidences where he says that there is a Simeon or a miracle that Jesus presented. Now, Jesus did many miracles. And uh, yet John selects out of the many he did seven around which he builds his case for Jesus. Now, let me uh, take you to the key to the Gospel of John, uh, and we'll see something that will help us define this word. Please turn with me to John chapter 20 for a moment. One thing about John he always gives you a clear clue to the outline of the book he writes. Just like in the book of Revelation, he gave us a clear clue of the movements of the gospel and its outline. He does the same thing with the gospel of John. Now, in John chapter 20, verse 30, many other signs, Simeon, Miracles that give a sign. Many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not in this book. Now, I wish some of these self-proclaimed theologians, and you heard me speak of them, they always pop out uh, at just before Easter and just before Christmas. And they're always talking about how we 
uh, we have no evidence that there really is a Jesus. That Jesus and and they, they pop up with all of the things. Jesus could not have been God. He never claimed to be God and all of that stuff. Well, I wish they would. Re and one of the reasons these people do this, and if you've ever had a class in college called The Bible as Literature, then you'll know what I'm talking about. And if you haven't had that class, don't walk, run. Because it'll teach you more lies than you can possibly imagine. Because it goes to the so-called higher critical school, which is not higher, nor is it really honestly critical, or is it a school? It's a bunch of lying swine who have never been born again, <laughs> who have no business being in the theological class, much less in the Bible. But what they do is, uh, with their favorite target is to take the four Gospels and compare them with each other and say, well, see, uh, this Gospel includes this, but this other Gospel doesn't include that. Well, 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 John tells us right off the bat, he didn't include everything he knew. Neither did any of the authors of the Gospel. And I told you at the outset of this study that each author selected by God, was selected because of usually his background, his experiences, his awareness of certain aspects of the three different cultures that permeated the Roman Empire when this book was written, when the New Testament was written by the inspired authors. God selected and chose Matthew, who had been a tax collector but was very, very steeped in all of the culture of Israel and the religious things and so forth. He chose Matthew to write the Gospel of Matthew so that it would most appeal to the Jewish culture, the Hebrew culture. And so therefore, in Matthew's account of the life of Jesus, he selects from the things that Jesus did and said the things that would most appeal to the Hebrew mind. Now, is that hard to follow? Then you come to the Gospel of Mark, which really isn't the Gospel of Mark. I hate to shatter uh, things here, but it's the Gospel of Peter. Mark wrote it. Peter dictated it. He chose Peter because between him and Mark, they had a tremendous awareness of the Roman culture. And the Holy Spirit took from the things they knew and saw, and they used that to extend their purpose to most appeal to the Roman culture. Now, that's not hard to follow either, is it? And this can all be easily proven. For instance, uh, it's suicide for anybody to write a book and start with a genealogy. Ho-hum. But not to people who are Hebrews looking for a Messiah that had to have a genealogy that was precise and exact. But you don't find that in the opening of the Gospel of Mark. In fact, the Gospel of Mark goes from one event to the other event. He, Jesus would do one thing recorded in the Gospel of Mark, and then it says, and straight away he'd do this, and straight away he would do this. And he emphasized the things that Jesus did as a man of action, as a man of power. And he doesn't spend a lot of time talking about prophecies being fulfilled from the Old Testament. He uses some. Not a lot. Doesn't talk a lot about genealogy, but he talks about the things that Romans would say. You see, the Romans were the men from Missouri. Okay, you say, uh, you say that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, what did he do? Show me. What did he do? And so, boom, 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 one thing right after another. And the climax of the Gospel of Mark is the testimony of one of the most respected men in the Roman culture, a centurion. 
And he just happened to be the centurion of the watch that executed him. And centurions had one expertise that could not be excelled. They had seen many men die personally. And when this centurion saw Jesus die and the way he died, it was that that caused him to explain, surely this man was the son of God. So it was written to be the most powerful testimony to the Romans. The Gospel of Luke. Luke was a, a he was a Jew, but he had been schooled in Greek extensively. He was the most learned of the writers, and probably he was the author of the Gospel of Hebrews. Or I should say the Epistle of Hebrews. He had some part in it, I believe. And he selected his material in order to be the most powerful message to convince the Greek culture. So he starts out by carefully documenting when certain things began. And uh, he does it in the most classic way of historians of that time. So he starts out and goes on like a scholar. And the Greeks worship the concept of a perfect man. All of their statues of their gods are men. And so what Luke does is show from the humanity, emphasizing the humanity of Jesus, that he had to be uh, a perfect man. It's interesting that uh, Matthew emphasized what Jesus said. Mark emphasized what he did. Luke emphasizes how he felt. Just one of the observations that you find. But the Gospel of John was not written to any certain culture. It was written for all time. And it was the last book of the Bible, as I told you, the last book of the Bible, I should say, the, well, the Bible, but also the last book of the New Testament to be written. He wrote it after he was freed from Patmos and had written the Apocalypse, the Red Book of Revelation. And he wrote it because he was urged to write it by all the elders of the church at Ephesus. So he is very careful to tell us why he wrote this gospel, because there were three out there already. So he says, many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. So he shows that this was a selective gospel and that it is an attested gospel because he says it was these things were done in the presence of all the disciples. But it's also, it has one driving purpose. And this is why he took from the true incidences he witnessed in the life of Jesus and put them together to do this one thing. And that's in verse 31. But these have been written. That, number one, you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, literally. Number two, the Son of God. See, there's a lot of confusion in the Hebrew religion by the time Jesus came as to how the Messiah and Son of God concept fit together. Well, he shows that the Scripture says he's both the Messiah and the Son of the living God. And then he says the third thing, and that believing, you may have life in his name. So those three things are the reasons why he wrote the Gospel of John. First, that you may believe the purpose that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the promised one, that he is the Son of God, which means he's both, uh, both the expected Messiah in the line of David, but also deity. 
and that believing this, you may have life in his name. So these things, this is the reason why it says he selected the signs, the simeons, the, the miracles that he chose. And so it's in that context now that I want to bring you back to John chapter 2. And uh, to, we've already gone over that this was the first miracle the last time I was here. I've already gone over the uh, meaning of what he said to his mother Mary and so forth. But this time, I want to get into what was the, the deeper hidden meaning in this first miracle. All right, let's look. It says in uh, his mother said to him, and uh, this is in verse 5, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Well, actually 30 gallons or firkins, which would have amounted to 30 gallons each. This is something that everyone else had ignored, but John saw that Jesus didn't ignore it, that there were these uh, water pots, earthen water pots. And he, he says, and Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. Then he said, draw some of it out now and take it to the head waiter. And they took it to him. And when the head waiter tasted the water, which he had become wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who drew the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, every man serves the good wine first, and when men have drunk freely, then that which is poor, you have kept the good wine until now. This is the beginning of his sameons, the miracles of signs. This was the beginning of... Uh, Jesus, that Jesus did them in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. All right, now, I want you to look at something. First of all, it specifically says there were six earthen water jars. You know, in the Bible, the numbers are used in a certain way over and over and over again. So that numbers, certain numbers have a very definite symbology. What's the number six stand for? Man. Stands for man. Man was created on the sixth day. Now, but the number, it's the book of Revelation, John said, six, which is the number of man, chapter 13. So six is a number of man. So Jesus is doing this miracle, and in the subplot, he's emphasizing something that can be done in just any man. Now, he uses earthen jars, and these earthen jars were filled usually with water in order to uh, for ceremonial cleansing of the feet when anyone would enter a Jewish home. And so they were for the purpose of cleansing the feet. Okay? Another very important factor he's teaching us here. Because Jesus explains something beautiful in John chapter 13. I want you to hold your place here and let's go to John 13, verse 4. Jesus rose up from supper and laid aside his garment, and taking a towel, he girded himself about. Then he poured out uh, water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel which he was, with which he was girded. And so he came to Simon Peter, and he said to him, Lord, do you think you're going to wash my feet? That's the way he'd say it. So in typical Peter fashion, he opened his mouth to change feet. He was always blurting something out. It was always from a good heart. 
but he, he usually spoke before he put mouth in gear to brain. So he said, you think you're going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, what I do to you, now look at it carefully, what I do to you, you do not realize now, but you shall understand hereafter. See, he was setting up something that had a deeper meaning. Peter said to him, never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And then t Peter, in typical fashion, goes from one extreme to the other. Peter said to him, Lord, <laughs> not my feet only, but also my hands, my head, and the whole works. And then verse 10, Jesus said to him, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet but is completely clean, and you're all clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him, and for this reason he said, not all of you are clean. And then he said, do you know what I've done to you, and so forth. Okay, well, what did he do? Now, look carefully at what he said, up against the, uh, the concept of the bathhouse. Now, when a person goes to take a bath at the bathhouse, he takes a bath all over, but when he gets home on the way from the bathhouse to home, he has to wash his feet. He doesn't have to go back and take a whole bath. I mean, it'd be catch-22. You'd be going back and forth, back and forth. So, no. So Jesus says, against that familiar practice, he says, the one who has been bathed, and he uses the perfect tense in the original Greek. Up on the word bathe, to bathe. He who has been bathed in the past with the results, he goes on being bathed forever, is, is the meaning of the perfect tense here. Does not need to be bathed again, but only to wash his feet. Now, can you figure out what that means? The washing of regeneration is what he is portraying here. When you believe in Jesus Christ, you're born spiritually. As it says that uh, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by his mercy, he has is, he is forgiven us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Now, you see, that's what happens in the moment you accept Jesus Christ as dying for your sins and receive the gift of pardon he purchased for you, you are at that moment washed through the renewing of the Holy Spirit and you are born again with a new divine spiritual nature. You still have the old sin nature, which we have to deal with until we leave this life. But you've been bathed. And you don't need to ever be born again again. You understand what I'm saying? But in this world, while you're walking home in your daily life, you get your feet dirty. And you need to get your feet cleaned frequently. And God just has, happens to have a great, effective bar soap. It's called 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins... To God, that's the context, not to anybody else. To God, if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just. That's the most important thing. He's not only faithful to wash our feet and cleanse our daily life, but he is also justified in doing it because your sins have already all been paid for. So he just applies that cleansing to your feet. Why? Be because once you've been born again, the most important thing is to stay in fellowship with God. But you can't be in fellowship with God if your feet are dirty. 
are if there is some known sin in your life. So you cleanse that by simply confessing the sin to God and claiming the forgiveness that's already yours. That's how you wash feet. And the biggest problem I find today is that Christians put themselves on guilt trips. All right, so you sin. First John chapter 1 says, if we say that we have no sin, we're a liar. And he's talking about Christians. So, so you sin. All right, that's bad. We shouldn't as Christians sin. But what's worse is if you fail to confess the sin, or even worse than that, you confess the sin, but you don't believe God. Then you got two sins. The sin you committed in the first place, and the sin of not believing God's word when he says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Join us next week for the continuation of How Lindsay's Bible Study of the Book of John. You can find more of How Lindsay at his website, www.howlindsay.com. There you can access our video and article archives. Visit our online store for Hal Lindsey CDs, books, and other specialty items. Hal Lindsey's comprehensive teaching on the Gospel of John is now available as an audio book. This incredible teaching will enrich your personal study of the book of John and enhance your understanding of the nature and character of Jesus Christ. Hal Lindsey is pleased to present his first ever audiobook, Faith for Earth's Final Hour, read in its entirety by Joel Weldon, professional voiceover artist. Recognizing the truth of Titus 3.5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. This audiobook is now available for purchase in three formats, a nine CD set for $44.99 plus shipping and handling, a USB flash drive for $44.99 plus shipping and handling, or as an audio download from HalLindsay.com for $24.99. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Hal Lindsay Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147 You can also support this ministry online. Visit howlindsay.com or call 1-888-RAPTURE.